Hey everyone, Tactics here, and in this long overdue video, I'm going to be giving you guys some tank tips for the first five bosses of Sepulchre of the first ones on Mythic difficulty. I'll be going through things like positioning, uh, like defensive usage, uh, and kind of the differences moving up from Heroic going into the Mythic difficulty, and I'll have, of course, timestamps down below for all five of the different bosses if you want to jump around down there. I'll also be putting up videos for the bosses uh, later on, the tier bosses, and of course the Jailer himself eventually, so make sure you guys subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you know when those get posted. Otherwise, let's start here. Boss number one, Vigilant Guardian. So, the main difference here uh, is that on pull, you'll have about 10-ish seconds here. You pull the, uh, the Custodian, and then boss just rolls right out. So that's the main mythic difference here. Uh, the other thing is bombs, but that's not really going to be a tank thing. Uh, you're going to have one player assigned to handle those usually. Uh, and so everything associated with dealing with this boss uh, is true at the beginning of this fight here. So he's got that tank buster at 50 energy, fully cosmic damage, by the way. Uh, so any type of uh, magic mitigation or just general DR is what you want to do for that. Of course, and then he'll do that big star pattern thing centered off the current tank at 100 energy. And so that is the one thing uh, you want to focus on positioning correctly uh, about. So basically, you want to kind of make sure the boss is static when he's doing that ability here. And so that it's predictable, right? Because that pattern is always off the tank. And so if you're always, if you always have the boss positioned in the same way uh, compared to your raid, then they're always going to know where the safe spots are. So that's the real big thing to remember. Don't be spinning the boss around when it's time for that star mechanic to come out. Make sure the boss is stationary, and so it's easily predictable where that star pattern is going to form so the rest of your raid can easily dodge it. But the main thing here, aggro can be a bit of a problem. You see, we do kind of make sure that people are positioned in such a way that the ads will kind of run through uh, the tanks. And you see there, I, I just step over a little bit, get those two mobs, come back. Aggro, aggro can be a bit of a problem on this boss, so you want to make sure your raid is positioned in, in that way. So like, these far ads, they have to run through us to get to the raid. These ads down here, they run through us to get to the raid, right? So that's the main thing. You see here, we have this first defense matrix open up. Temperature's at 95, so we're just going to step into this and try and keep the ads outside of it. Use knocks and stuns and stuff. Uh, because, of course, if they're in this defense matrix, they'll also get the DR. Uh, it's not the end of the world here. The main thing is when we do this transition here after this first set of uh, AoEs, one tank just runs right off with this boss. Because they're going to get that first star pattern coming pretty quickly, so no one has to worry about it. And then everyone else kills this defense matrix to get the first bomb and this sentry. That is the one thing to remember, is that these sentries are actually the most important kill target uh, in this fight. Not only do they do a decent chunk of tank damage, uh, but they are basically the whole reason killing them is what's going to end up powering up these defense matrixes. And on the topic of those defense matrixes, uh, so I believe on this pull we actually only kill the one. We don't need to kill the second one. Uh, when you're in farm, you're probably just going to be able to do it with one defense matrix. But when you're progging this boss early on in Mythic Progression, you'll probably need both because they do 15% of the Guardian's health each time. So you have to worry about uh, killing these ants quick enough to spawn it. It's not too difficult. Uh, but just just keep that in mind. It can switch up timings a fair bit. Uh, now on the topic of the of the bomb mechanic, as I mentioned, tanks are not going to be doing this because usually the tanks are running around uh, collecting ads or trying to hold the boss still for that star mechanic, right? So here they are. These are these traps. And you basically just want to make sure uh, you're not touching them uh, as they'll put a, a stacking dot on you, similar to Painsmith traps, except you are perfectly fine stacking them. These are there. We do, we just did two. Uh, you can do three, four. Uh, sometimes, but it uh, can get a little scary. You might need to commit like some sort of healing CD to it. And as you see there, that star pattern actually did detonate those as well. So just keep that in mind. All those abilities that the laser beam, those can all detonate those traps as well. Uh, so you may need to uh, position the boss in such a way that the star pattern will avoid those traps. So that can be a little bit more tricky. Uh, you see here, we're pushing this boss below uh, that 40% threshold. And at that point, the ads stop spawning. So you just kind of clean up uh, all the ads. Uh, and that's that's pretty much it. At this point, the boss is just the heroic boss fight with the trap spawning. And, and that's it. So that, that's pretty much Vigilant Guardian. It is actually one of the harder first bosses uh, in a long time. I think it's probably the hardest in Shadowlands. Maybe Shadowlands and BFA as well. It's, it's a pretty tough first boss. 
So, uh, you know, I, I don't really like it, to be honest with you. I'm not a huge fan of the, uh, the ad fights. And there's, it's a lot of chaos. It's all right. It's not terrible, though. But, uh, yeah, there, there we have Vigilant Guardian. Boss number one. All right, next one. Skolex. All right, we got Skolex coming up. Uh, this fight compared to Heroic is pretty much entirely the same for tanks. The main thing is it just hits a lot harder, right? So the here with the tank combo, of course, you're alternating your Rift Maws. It's also much more important to alternate your bleeds uh, from one tank combo to the next. The standard strat that we've been doing is three sets of wretches before forcing the uh, burrow. So that there's the first, we'll do it three times. So that means three sets of tank debuffs are going out uh, before you burrow. Uh, and so making sure that one tank is taking the odd bleeds, the other tank is taking the even bleeds. Of course, the tank combo is always made up of two of the magic hits and one of the bleeds. Uh, and that way, you you know, you're not going to get a double stack bleed on any tank. You're not going to extend any bleeds on any tank. And it's just a whole lot easier from a tank damage perspective. Uh, the other thing is a little bit more positioning wise, and that's going to be during the red soak. So let's just fast forward a tiny bit here uh, to when we're actually doing a soak. Should be coming up in a second here. Fast forward, fast forward. Okay, here it is. Okay, so we're going to get this wretch in like two seconds here, and this is our stack. So you see we're going to stack up here, mid wretch, just in the wretch, and the tanks go to the edge here. The two tanks are here. The entire rate is there, and that's so you bounce in the correct directions, uh, and that way this doesn't happen. So yeah, basically, positioning-wise, pretty much everyone did it, but yeah, you, you avoid... The back half of the circle, the close half of the circle from where the boss is, that's where the two tanks go so no one gets accidentally cleaved. Everyone else ends in the back half of the circle again, so positioning is just, you're you're right there where you need to be. Of course, the range stack and the three people outside, and then the melee stack doing their own little little dance thing there. I will say, though, uh, just beware tanks, of course, uh, of the melee puddles. They don't usually spawn on you unless the melee stack starts getting a little close uh, for, for whatever reason, because if you do get hit by those blue swirlies, it leaves a puddle and they're not dispellable, so you just need to be aware if that starts to happen. Otherwise, though, fight is very straightforward. Uh, it 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 does hit fairly hard, though, so be be prepared for that. And of course, it does have that same kind of um, damage intake mechanic that Sludge Fist has, right? So there's kind of a hierarchy uh, of which tank is better to be tanking the boss himself. Uh, to reduce the overall tank damage because, of course, that damage just splash to your tank partner. So just keep that uh, in mind. Otherwise, though, pretty simple boss. Just kind of a throughput check there. Moving on, we have Mr. Zymox. So I actually do think Zymox is the third easiest boss. Uh, I, I, I think it's much easier than Sausage, to be honest with you. And on our reclears, I mean, that's kind of uh, proven to be true as well. So the big thing for Zymox here is you get to deal with these platforms. So this is a pull... Uh, where I deal with platforms. So I'm going across. I just go across right away. I think I moonfire the boss and leave. Uh, this is where we get to see some Venther Guardian shenanigans. Uh, we're three manning or four manning with the healer. This entire platform by ourselves with just two rogues popping CDs and a Venther Guardian Druid popping CDs. Uh, it's a lot of damage. It's pretty nice. Get to do big numbers. Uh, but yeah, so pretty much this guy is a tankable ad. He does that frontal cone, as you saw, just like the intermission ad, uh, but it doesn't, it's not stoppable, so you have to just dodge it. It's it's stationary, so you can just walk out of it. Those little ads, just pulse ticking damage that stacks, that uh, stays on you for the rest of the fight, so it means if you go to multiple platforms, you'll be taking more and more ticking damage. As a tank, it's not a big deal. I just I just AFK it, you know, it's not a, it's not a huge deal, just a little bit extra ticking, but uh, it kind of prevents you from sending DPS too many times. Ah, uh, yes, someone moved our markers here, so I had to uh, replace the markers, find the exact spot. Uh, actually, it's a good time to talk about it. So let's talk about uh, uh, marker positioning and why they are where they are. Let's back up. Uh, so let's look as I place it. Okay, so there we go. I, we got them all. Okay, so center and skull. So that's where we do in P1. The center is just always the tank. We always have the tank drop off in the center when the center needs to be dropped off. And we always have the uh, other DPS or drop it off on the edges. So in phase one, we go center and skull. And that's because, of course, the ring comes out from the center. And so you have the range baiting your traps over here where it's covered by the raid marker thing. Uh, and then the tank will just go 
sit out by skull, step in, uh, and then they'll bring when they get the uh, the pull, they'll run out to beside skull, like right there, pull everyone there, and while well, everyone else kind of stays here to reduce that fall off damage. In P2, it goes center again, and the green one there. Uh, of course, the raid is kind of baiting in this general area, the range that is for traps. Uh, this area stays clear, and the circles come from initially the inside and then the outside. And that's where we're going to get to some tank porting shenanigans that I'll talk to you guys about. Uh, usually you'll have to do that twice in the second phase there, hopefully beating that third one. In phase three, uh, we have the first set of ports going to this diamond and this circle. So not in the center initially, diamond and circle. And that's to avoid, again, that, that pattern of rings. There's three rings that come out in a row for the first set of rings in P3. And then assuming uh, as soon as you push the boss below 30%, you start to trigger that, uh, that extra uh, ramped up phase uh, there. And so at that point, there's a marker way off to the edge there, right on the edge of the platform. That's where the one uh, port goes and the other goes here. And I'll explain that as, as we see them as well. Uh, but yeah, P1, pretty simple. Push at 75. Uh, let's, the intermissions are the exact same, by the way. I'll, I'll show you this first one uh, just, you know, because. So we have the Acolytes, taunt them in. Make sure you stop their cones. We have a, a rogue assigned to each Acolyte. Uh, we also have DK grips here, pretty valuable. Keep kicks. Kicks are super, super important, right? Keep kicking these uh, spell slingers even when they're in, and you just focus the acolytes. Immediately after these guys dying, group two goes uh, to the next platform. So you see, they're they're all going to the next platform, and I'm taking the boss. Now this is the uh, where you're going to see the tank porting shenanigans. So tank port here, other player port goes to green, and let's actually fast forward. Rings are in ten seconds. Actually, we'll just we'll just we'll just let it play out. We'll just go, we'll watch the rings. And you'll see how the Venthyr port. So specifically, this will work on any tank that's Venthyr. It also works on Paladins as they can bubble. Uh, DKs can AMS and Brewmasters can port as well. Uh, just their, their Transcendence port. So you see here, it comes from the center and the outside. Always, always that combination. You teleport inside and you see this one always comes from the outside here. And so you Venthyr port. Time the Venthyr port for two seconds. And you pull everyone to safety. No one needs to do anything else. You can port everyone to safety, and you do the you can do the exact same thing for the second set of ports. Uh, after though, of course, that's kind of a bad trap bait, but it's not the end of the world. You'll see it again in five seconds. I will do the exact same thing. That first one is actually a bit tighter. Uh, I found than the the second one. You see, the second one is a little bit easier to hit. So again, the exact same thing. Ring comes out from the inside first. Go inside, rings coming from the outside in, and you just time your port to be between those two rings, and you just chill, and you pull everyone to safety, and that's it. That is it for that. So uh, next, let's go to the last phase. Let's go to the last phase real quick. Show you guys that. So I'm already on the platform. Bad. Already on the platform. Okay, so I leave to do the ads again here, because Venthyr ramp is back up. Uh, go here. Yeah, okay, so we'll kill this stuff here. Again, priority is to kill those little ads, actually. The big ad is actually the least important on these platforms. The little ads are what's going to insta-wipe you if they get their cast off. Here it is. It comes from the inside, then the outside, then the inside. So what you do here is you port, then the tank. He's bubbling to walk through it, but you can just port as well. And then everyone needs to spread for this and then take the port again. So it's port. Uh, so, so it's you take this gate, I guess I'll call it a gate, then the tank uses any movement to get through the rings, and then you take gate again. That's how it works. Uh, and then we're just lusting here to push the boss below 30% so that we trigger the uh, phase 4, whatever it is, you know, stage 4. And then you see X right there on the edge, and of course we're going to put it back in the center again uh, for this last set of portals. So let me fast forward again till we see that. There it is. So portals are down, and we're going to sit right beside this portal, right on the edge of it, uh, and you're going to see why. So basically what happens here is two come from the middle, then two come from the outside. So that's how this pattern works. So you wait until that second one comes out of the middle, then you take, you pop all defensives on this bomb because you don't run very far. We're also rallying it. Pretty much rally alone is fine. And then two come from the outside, so now you're sitting, 
You're not teleporting because there's another one. You're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're going at the last second. And that's it. Fight is done uh, at, at that point. So it's a uh, pretty, pretty big positioning fight. Uh, not so much a, a, a throughput check. You have the DPS checks on the platforms. Uh, but it's really about where you're putting all of your gates uh, and your timing. So that's that's the main important thing. Do note, though, of course, that um, the timings for the fight and when you're getting to the ad platforms can vary depending on how fast you push the boss, right? Their percent pushes. So be careful about putting things like two-minute classes or, or three-minute classes and expecting them to have CDs up. Because, uh, for example, like when we were first progging on this boss, we were getting to that second platform at around two minutes. But then on our first rekill, we were getting there at like a minute 30. So it really threw things off. So just be aware of that because uh, that can be a, a bit difficult to deal with. Otherwise, though, uh, m a pretty much just a positioning boss fight. Really cool fight, though. I I'm, I'm a fan of it. I am a fan of it. All right, moving on the sausage. The sausage really only has one change, and that's uh, the rings will splash when you pass over them uh one and a half yards i believe is the splash radius so you basically just don't cro cross the halos with uh anyone else on top of you and you're good honestly a tank can probably survive one person on top of them but the other person dead so basically this just splashes people we just kind of spread out and fan out a little bit some people run forward through the ring some people plant uh, if you have a good mix of that, it's it's pretty easy to get through uh, those rings relatively safely. Now, in terms of the tank mechanic here, uh, I should talk about barrages. So you see what we're doing here. The entire raid is in this barrage, except for one little magey boy over here. Uh, that is our strat for every single barrage. So every odd set of barrages is everyone but one immunity soak. And we have two frost mages alternating uh, is what we're doing. So everyone but one frost mage is soaking this. Then the next one is guaranteed to go on that person that didn't soak. So it guaranteed going on that frost mage. He blocks it. It uh, makes it a lot easier to deal with uh, in terms of positioning and stuff. Because you only have to do that movement and deal with that knockback every other barrage. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, tank debuff. So the obliter... Uh, not obliteration arcs. Sorry. The infused strikes. So it's a swap at around four stacks. But it's a very tentative number it's really just kind of whenever your stacks fall off and you can taunt because the boss will kind of spell q uh, a lot of times in a row and you'll just drop stacks at like two sometimes right so uh, whenever your stacks fall off feel free to taunt because the danger in that dot is actually in the fact that it, it's ticking it's a ticking dot right so it's a like a 20 second duration dot so you really the, the boss does melee pretty hard but really the danger comes uh later on in those high dot uh, and those high stack situations, right? So the inactive tank is actually getting hit harder than the active tank most of the time. So just be aware of those dot stacks. Of course, they detonate, but at four stacks, the detonation is not really relevant. So that that's kind of why four stacks is the general number. Obviously, again, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes five. You really want to avoid going above four, though, because, again, that dot will start to hurt uh, a significant amount. Uh, so now let's talk about the inf the baiting here. So actually, let's rewind because that, that's a good spot to show our strat on baiting the uh, obliteration arcs. So when we see here, because of course those orbs will tell you which platform or which pillar rather is going to shoot the halo first, we decide how we're going to bait the arcs accordingly. So we wait here. Rings are coming up very soon. You're going to see the orbs come out here. And so we see orange is first, so we're baiting to the left here. So everyone's going to move to the left here. We have that ad, because of course ads are always focused. We have this arc to deal with, and then we baited this to the side here. If it had been green first, we would have moved to the other direction and bait, had range bait that off to this side instead. Uh, but obviously it went this way, so that's kind of the decision. You see the orbs, you immediately break Do that. We pull the ad off to the edge here. Uh, that's nothing. We talk about ad positioning. The main thing you want to avoid with this ad is putting it near where you need to stack for the intermission phases. Uh, so you want to always bring it off either to an edge or at the beginning of the fight, you see we tank it right by pillar four because they expire in two minutes, right? So if you drop puddles on pillar four, not the end of the world. You're not going to be anywhere near that place for two minutes anyways. Uh, and that way it's nowhere near uh, the orange platform. So as you saw at the beginning, actually, we tanked over here. And then we moved across after the second ad had spawned. The other phase is you get three ads, I believe. So 
we're just tanking over here, tanking over here, baiting that cone off to the edge to make it very easy to avoid. Uh, and then just kind of chilling here. I believe we also get it uh, same pattern. So we get orange pylon first here uh, in, in 10 seconds. Uh, here's again. So there's the immunity soak in action, right? Just kind of chilling. Uh, yeah, so rings here coming up again. And with these rings as well, don't be afraid to use Venthyr Port or Night Fae Blink. I don't think I actually use it anytime because I'm bad. Uh, but I, I, I'm literally talented into the Venthyr Port here. Because here I'm planting for this, keeping the ad on the edge. Care for those puddles because they do deal a significant amount of damage if you stand in them. So just kind of trying to make sure you're sidestepping those. See, I'm backing up a little bit. And again, main thing here is keeping these puddles away from the teleport spot, which is like around here. If those puddles, those puddles do grow a significant amount during those intermissions. So you, you'll, you'll watch them here. They're going to grow pretty large. Uh, so anything in this general vicinity puddle wise is just bad news because the puddle damage combined with the damage you're taking already here is just completely lethal uh, and, and, and not going to be good for, uh, for living. So uh, this is kind of the hardest part of the fight here. At this point, if you literally just live to the next shield, the boss kind of dies, right? So we see the green is the first pylon, so we try and do a big move here. We're a little slow, a little scattered. That's okay. That was a, that was a bad bait. We'd ideally be baiting it down here, but that's okay. At this point, again, the priority is the ad the entire time, and it can get very chaotic, but you cannot forget to do your taunt on the boss here at, at whenever your stacks drop. It's super, super important to get that taunt off. Otherwise, uh, you know, like big, big damage is going out uh, during this time. Uh, we have an immunity soak here. This is normally a sack we do. The first... Uh, first set of soaks in this phase, the last phase, we always sack just because there's so much chaos going on. Uh, luckily, that was the mage that got picked there, so easy immunity. But otherwise, that would be a sack, uh, and that's that's pretty much it. So make sure you're using those Venthyr ports, Night Fae blinks. Uh, again, less important for tanks, but still relevant, right? That would probably save me a decent amount of damage if I had actually used my port there. So uh, make sure you guys are, are making use of that if you can. Your tank that can run those covenants uh, without using or losing too much definitely worth uh, the fact that you will be taking less damage. And again, another fight where it's it's big on positioning, but also I mean the boss does kind of truck. The boss does hit fairly hard uh, and mostly magic damage. So be aware of that. Otherwise, though, not too bad of a fight. And moving on to our final boss uh, before the tier bosses is Prototype Pantheon. So this is another boss, kind of like Skolex, where it's almost exactly the same as Heroic. But again, positioning now is much more important. So uh, the main change is Denathrius, the Night Hunter lines come in the phases, and you need to use them, here they are, to break the Ritualists and the Seeds out before you can actually deal full damage or healing to them. They can deal partial damage, as you can see here, uh, but you don't get full damage to them unless their shield is gone. And to do that, the Night Hunter line needs to be through them. So, as you see here, our positioning, we are not dragging these bosses. Uh, because we basically have teams assigned to kill all three of the adds that aren't here, including this ad here. So, what we have here is the melee cleave DPS and the guys assigned to kick war. They're basically the same DPS. Uh, kicks here, super important. You see, we have the kick weak aura. Uh, in the kicks for war, we have both tanks and the two DPS, two melee DPS that don't move to kill the adds and that's what we always guaranteed have four kicks on war four melee kicks on war to make sure that those gloom bolts do not go off because those gloom bolts are deadly especially in the last phase they deal a big hit of damage and they put a massive healing absorb on people you need those kicks to be kicked and so we always put both tanks on war and two stationary melee dps uh in terms of who's moving to ritualists uh, of course, we have the uh, the range DPS assigned to this one and the back one, and we have the single target melee DPS assigned to uh, the other one right here, this close one there. Uh, and there's also a weak aura to deal with where Night Hunter should be going based on markers. Uh, in terms of debuffs here, this last set of debuffs, because we're beating this ritual, we just don't dispel them until after the ritual. Uh, and, and let's talk a little bit about positioning quickly. Here, so this is the spot where the ad spawns, right? So we tank them right on top of the ad here for extra cleave whenever there's an ad up. So even when it's the set of ads that we're not focused on killing, this can give certain classes extra boss damage. 
it just to have that third target to cleave so we tank them there when duty kind of flies up with the winds in 24 seconds let's uh let's go see that wins in five seconds you see we do try it is ideal to try and get war up here to the top of the room if you can as close as you can to try and get some cleave obviously it's never worth taking one of these swirlies so if you have to kind of back up to avoid a swirly do it but the most get as much cleave as you can and you want to get these guys down together uh, honestly it's not the end of the world if duty is the lower one of the two so you see we will do a hard swap to duty here because we want duty to get lower uh, because we found in phase three that a lot of the times the one that just accidentally fell over first was war so having war be a little bit higher is not the end of the world and that's because war and duty actually both have less health than absolution and renewal and of course, duty flies up and away during the winds. So that's why war tends to die first. So duty being a little bit lower, not the end of the world. In terms of phase two stuff. So we have one tank, of course, picking up absolution, dragging him over to this spot right here. Renewal also dragged to this spot, but of course she's moves much slower. Uh, so it takes a little, about the same amount of time to put them in that spot that's much closer to renewal. Uh, again, kicks are, are assigned to this boss. We have four kicks uh, and that those are all ranged kicks of some sort i believe it's like uh sh shaman kicks mage kicks and demon hunter kicks are assigned to renewal uh, i believe it is a and that's because of a couple of reasons so one of course dps are usually going to be run away uh, usually going to be that's not english dps are usually not going to be on the bosses for that whole ad phase at the beginning of p3 and so you want them to have a range kick to be able to kick them while still hitting their own ads on top of this, the Tornado Anima Storm ability uh, is a little spooky for Melee to be right on top of Renewal uh, when that's going on. Case in point, right? Extra damage you don't want to be taking necessarily. And so having a full ranged kicks on Renewal makes that easier. Also, that hand, which you're going to see coming up in 20 seconds here, you'll still be able to kick Renewal running away from that hand. So a lot of reasons to have ranged kicks on renewal so that's what we uh, ended up doing positioning here notice a little bit of a gap here and that's also to help with these anima storms and give melee a spot to be and a spot to easily dodge those storms they're still cleaving both but the gap is big enough that they can easily avoid taking that extra damage from the storms so that's why we did that of course here tanks can actually just hard afk in this circle it really doesn't hurt and it gives a lot more space for people to spread along and dodge and avoid these puddles the main thing here of course racking pain is a frontal cone so don't don't get hit by the frontal cone uh, for the stampedes just watch where the animals are spawning from right you get an indicator the animal kind of chills on the edge before it starts so you're going to move here accordingly uh we got pretty decent spawns actually on this pull like sometimes for a while we were getting a spawn literally right through the seed as our first spawn and that's like the worst that's the worst spawn uh, ever so uh, just be aware you, you may have to move pretty big uh depending on these animal spawns note this last night hunter not a big deal uh we don't really worry about rolling seed buffs or anything like that we just go 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 uh a note on the night hunters actually as a tank player because you're standing near where a lot of them are breaking one thing right we're near this seed or near that ad over here um if you can just sidestep and be in a line that is pretty helpful because it reduces the damage the person's taking uh which which can be a big deal so uh it's it barely affects you if you can sidestep into someone's night hunter line without drastically moving the bosses i would definitely recommend doing it it'll it'll help them out a lot P3, of course, uh, they all come down. Lots of chaos. Priority cleave ads here, again, are Renewal and, uh, where is he? Absolution. Those guys have more health than the other two for whatever reason. Notice tank positioning here. One tank has duty. One tank has absolution. They are faced in different directions. The tanks, that's just that tank spot kind of deal positioning wise. And that's, again, so we know where the frontal cone is going. They both do the tank buster at the same time. And so we swap at one stack. Uh, just to make, you know, make life very simple, very easy. Again, the DPS groups are just splitting. That's when we lust as well to make those ads die very quickly. And again, war kicks, super important. We're trying to get up to the top here to cleave a little bit extra on duty. Uh, but, you know, again, priority is to dodge those swirlies. Because getting hit by those swirlies is bad news, especially if you're you're the tank. So just uh, be aware of those. 
get as close as you can, but don't don't risk it and be aware because yeah, that frontal cone comes right out of that ability uh, of that wind there in P3. So it can be can be a little bit sketchy, can be a little bit sketchy. But yeah, that that is that is this fight. There we have it, guys. My walkthrough for the first five mythic bosses in Sepulcher of the first ones. Remember, if you learn something, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel to be notified when I post more content like it. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be going through every single mythic boss uh, and doing a similar uh, you know tips walkthrough for them from a tank's perspective and also to be doing high key content dragon flight content really hype for that so uh make sure you guys stick around for that and you can also check me out on twitch where i stream all that stuff at tactics from a tank pov that's it for me though guys thank you all so much for watching and i'll see you in the next video